I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Robert Samuels, who teaches advanced writing at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He holds doctorates in psychoanalysis and English and is the author of several books, including Psychoanalyzing the Politics of the New Brain Sciences, Freud for the 21st Century, Why Public Higher Education Should Be Free, and Psychoanalyzing the Left and Right After Donald Trump. Links to his work can be found in the text accompanying this episode, and this discussion is available to view on YouTube. Just visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel. Search for Trapart Film, Rendering Unconscious Podcast, or my name. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious psychoanalytic perspectives, politics, and poetry. From Chapart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l your support is greatly appreciated so where would you like to begin um usually you talk about someone's history with psychoanalysis and i think i have kind of a interesting history. Um, I was an undergraduate at Cornell and I was studying political philosophy and I had a professor, Dominic Le Capra, who studies, uh, I mean teaches European intellectual history. So I started reading Freud and Lacan and Derrida and Heidegger and um, so then I went to graduate school. They had something called the Philosophy Consortium in New York City. Um, It was Columbia University, the New School and um, uh, let's see, on NYU. And I was studying um, philosophy and I wanted to um, do my dissertation on Heidegger and Lacan. And, um, but then I was very interested in Derrida. So I got a scholarship to go to Paris for a year to, to work with Derrida. And then, so what happened was I also wanted to take classes in psychoanalysis. And so I went to the University of Paris 8, where the Department of Psychoanalysis is. And I didn't know anything about French education, the French educational system. I could read French very well, but I had like never spoken French. And so I go to the bureaucracy and I try to like sign up for a single class and I end up enrolling as a full-time student as um, in the doctoral program in psychoanalysis as a French student, like I had to take English as my second language. I had to take a test of English as a second language because I I filled out the form incorrectly because I really didn't understand what was, all these forms, I had no idea what it was. So then I went to the head of the Department of Psychoanalysis who is uh, Jacqueline Miller's brother, Gerard Miller. And I told him, I I just want to take a class. Like I don't want to be a PhD student and um, and he asked me, he said, like, well, how do you suffer? You know, and I'm like, well, and we just started talking. And then at the end of the conversation, I didn't learn anything about how to become a regular student or anything about the structure, but he said, how much do you want to pay me for this conversation? And so then I reached in my pocket and I had like, I think I gave him 200 francs, which at the time was $20. And so he says, come back tomorrow at two o'clock. I was like, okay, that's how I started my analysis. <laughs> <But> then, <laughs> um, so that is like, you know, and I, I went three days a week for like six years. Um, I think I paid like, well, what happened is quickly the exchange rate changed so that it, the cost doubled, but it still was relatively inexpensive. But I think that was an interesting technique because 
I played a role in the setting of the cost. And so if I resented it at any time, like I was part of it. And I thought that was a very interesting um, intervention. But, um, and then I studied with Jacqueline Miller. So I wanted to, I was gonna stay for a year, but I ended up staying for six years and got my PhD in psychoanalysis. It was totally unplanned for. And um, I used to have in one day, like I think Wednesdays, I had a class with Derrida. I had um, the lecture with Jacqueline Miller. I had in a class with um, uh, Julia Kristeva. And my brain was like exploding. And then I took a course with Guy Deleuze and with um, Alain Badieu. And like, and it was all basically free, which is kind of, you know, interesting in our Amazing. Context. Yeah. And so then I went back to New York and I, um, I opened up my own like practice and I started giving lectures at Columbia University. And um, I started working at this clinic, Washington Square Institute, which was like just a hodgepodge of, it was like a hotel for therapists. It was really huge. And it was like a factory, a therapy factory. And then I got a job, someone who I was, who came to my lectures at Columbia University worked at the Bronx Family Court in the court diversion program. And so she wanted me to go there to like turn the place into a Lacanian <laughs> Institute or whatever. And so I got, I worked for several years at the Bronx Family Court, kind of like as a court psychologist working mostly with um, young people and their families, trying to keep them out of the criminal justice system. But it was just a very stressful, difficult like job. It was during the epidemic of AIDS and um, uh, also of crack. And I was dealing a lot with gang members and their families and a lot of violence, a lot of just, you know, extreme behavior, you might say. And, um, but it was a very interesting experience. So then I decided, well, I want to become a professor. I want to teach because it was very stressful. Like this job, I, I had gotten my life threatened several times and I was just like, I want to like teach. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And, um, and also I was kind of still kind of young and I wanted to do something more active. So um, I decided I want to become a, a professor. Um, and so then I got a second degree in English literature and um, I got my first job at George Washington University. They had this human science program, but they quickly like closed it or started to close it down as soon as I got there. And then eventually I ended up in Santa Barbara and then I taught 10 years at UCLA and then I went back to Santa Barbara. So that's kind of like the history. And that's where you're at now. Basically, yeah. It's amazing though that you fell into psychoanalysis through like slips and bungled actions. Exactly. How perfect. <laughs> but I think, you know, I was open to adventure or um, my father was an inventor and a scientist. And so I think I was open to taking risks, like going to France and like knowing very little like French basically and enrolling in a program that I didn't know anything about and starting an analysis without- Why not? Really <laughs> that was also young. And then the other fortuitous thing that happened while I, while I was there, I, I met someone, I was studying German and I met someone in my German class who was um, the lead singer of a band, a pretty successful band, music rock band. And um, their drummer had just been in a car accident and I used to be a drummer. So then I became actually, I supported myself by being a drummer in a rock band for several years. So, and that was good because it just opened me up to really knowing a lot about French culture and French life. Like I got to meet a lot of French people and do a lot of French things, which was, you know, I think a good experience to have. Yeah, and so, at a really exciting time, it sounds like. Yeah, it was difficult too though, because I had to, support myself and also, you know, study all this stuff. And I was like reading Lacan like 12 hours a day and writing music and just kind of like, a, and going to analysis, a very weird combination of stuff. Um, but, you know, I thought it, it worked out well for me at least. 
I think everyone's in time and analysis is pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, I always, I, I remember re telling myself that it was always um, kind of, there's always something unexpected happening. It was never just like comfortable or totally like predictable. And it, and I thought, you know, um, I thought my analyst was like really a kind of a classical Freudian, like there's very little intervention. He used the like variable session thing. And I think what most people don't understand about this idea of like the short session or the variable session is I think the technique was mainly developed in order to force people to speak without thinking. That if you really want to do free association, you have to learn how to speak without thinking about what the other person is thinking. And that requires the analyst being, you know, mostly neutral. And, and I think very few therapists and analysts really understand what free association is and understand the role of analytic neutrality. There's been a large backlash against that. I think people don't see analysis as this kind of artificial relationship that it, that takes a very different way of trying to discover someone's like inner truth. And, um, and I think a lot of forms of therapy and psychoanalysis, you know, rely on just traditional forms of communication. And I think that has like virtually nothing to do with psychoanalysis. And um, I'm currently um, writing a book on, um, it's called like uh, what makes us human. And I'm trying to like argue that psychoanalysis offers um, like the best insight to understand what makes us human because it, it presents these very um, counterintuitive notions. So like one idea is um, we're not driven by biology or evolution or instincts that there's a certain gap in our biology that we have drives instead of instincts, which means that like in terms of sexuality, our objects are much more variable than other animals and our responses are much more variable. And so the humans, so one way of thinking about like free will, what gives us freedom is this lack of biological determinism. And what's interesting you find in neuroscience and evolutionary psychology is this effort to kind of return to um, a biological determinism. And, and then they also like say like, well, does free, free will exist? Free will doesn't really exist. We're really just um, predetermined by our genes and our um, social memes and that we really have no free will or control over anything. All we do is post facto rationalize um, these unconscious intuitive responses. Um, and so I think there's a massive misunderstanding of what it is to be a human there. And that's why they can use like experiments on rats in order to work on medication for people with anxiety disorders or other psychological problems is because they've eliminated the free will of the human being and they misunderstand, you know, what makes us human. And um, so I think that's a really interesting concept. And Another related concept is the notion of pleasure principle. And I think um, that's become like more and more important in my work. And I think, once again, I think people really misunderstand that, especially um, within psychoanalysis, where Freud kind of argues that um, pleasure is defined by the escape uh, from tension. So it's kind of a negative um, definition. And, and the joke, you know, to describe this, you can use the joke of the guy who like wears really tight shoes all the time. And someone says, why do you wear tight shoes? And he says, because it feels so good when I take them off. And so there's this kind of like release of tension. And, um, and Aristotle defines uh, catharsis, which is interesting. It's the term that Freud uses for his original method, catharsis as, um, in Aristotle, in the poetics, he defines Catharsis as the purgation, the purging of feelings of pity and fear. And so once again, it's this kind of like reaction or release. And he argues, Aristotle, that we go to theater um, in order to basically release tension and to escape feelings of pity and fear. And so I think that 
what we're seeing in our culture today is this um, use of like technology and media to give us instant access to pleasure. But the flip side of that is an escape from tension or conflict and ultimately an attempt to escape from reality. And, um, and, and with addictions, we also have the same dominance of the pleasure principle. So ultimately the pleasure principle leads to the death drive because if the goal is to reduce all tension and to um, escape any sense of um, conflict or anxiety, then um, addictions serve the function of trying to bring you almost to an inanimate state, which Freud says is what the death drive is, is ultimately if you reduce tension enough, then you're dead, right? And he says like basically human beings are driven to use as little mental and or physical energy as possible. So like we're, the only biological principle Freud has is that we're like predetermined to be lazy. And I think it's interesting in our culture, like you're seeing people outsource all of their um, like mental functions to technology, right? Like start with calculators, but spell checking, grammar checking, now Googling, and this idea that we're, we're not only outsourcing our minds, but we're also outsourcing all of our jobs to technology through automation. So it kind of shows this like desire to escape from like ourselves or to use as little mental and physical energy as possible. So I see that as like the greatest threat to the world is um, even more threatening than climate change or pandemics is this like drive to escape reality um, and to use as little mental and physical energy as possible. And the way that that's enabled through new technologies and through media consumption, you know, the idea is like Baudrillard says, you know, the picture he says at the end of the world is there'll be like the, the television will keep on showing its images um, even when all humankind has been destroyed. And it's kind of like, um, we've invested so much in technology and media because it gives us instant access to pleasure. But the flip side of pleasure is, is death in the sense, like we're escaping our own reality. How perfect to talk about that, this 100th year anniversary of Beyond the Pleasure Principle. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it's yep. very interesting. <laughs> so it's, when I did my dissertation in France, it was kind of, so I noticed something reading Freud that he almost always divided things into three. And I became obsessed by this because I remember Derrida saying that Heidegger argued, every thinker only thinks one thought. And I thought that was an interesting idea. And then I realized, well, Freud, it's kind of true. Like everything is about the relationship between nature, culture, and psychology. And he, like the id, ego, super ego, unconscious, conscious, preconscious, infantile, uh, latency, uh, puberty, like every, he basically looks at every problem and divides it in three. And those three components are almost all like, one is like trying to explain nature, one is trying to explain culture, and then one is trying to explain individual psychology. And I went to a lecture in Paris and this guy gave this lecture on the history of the, uh, it was a really old philosopher, like he was like a hundred years old. I mean, he looked a hundred years old and it was on the history of the triad in philosophy. And he went through like the whole history of philosophy and how every major philosopher tries to break everything into three. And I was like, okay, well that's my dissertation. But then I realized like with Lacan, almost everything is four, right? Like there's um, like his schema L, his famous schema L, there's four elements, right? And then he has the four discourses, each with four things. Mm -hmm. And then he has like the symbolic imagining real, but then also he adds like the object A. And so there's always like what he does is he takes in some ways um, Freud's three part structures and always adds a fourth element. Like that's the Lacan part. That's the, you know, he said the only thing he invented was the object A. So like he basically, um, added this fourth dimension to psychoanalysis. And um, so I wrote my dissertation on that and I was really inspired. So I started writing my dissertation and then Jacques-Alain Miller, who was an incredible lecturer. I mean, I have very ambivalent feelings about him after the fact, but incredible lecturer. And he taught a course called one, two, three, four, right? And de trois, quatre. And I was like, well, that's my dissertation. That's what I'm writing about. And so, um, I was assigned a different person to be my dissertation director. 
And it turned out, I had no idea, but like secretly he hated me there. And when I gave him like the first draft of my dissertation, he totally attacked it and rejected it and said that it was like just a paranoid delusion. And he also hated Americans. So then he also said like, you know, I'm like, whatever. And also at the same time, this is interesting, like the other like foreign student in the department who's close to their dissertation was Zizek. So Zizek, and what happened to Zizek defended his dissertation like nine months before me. And um, I wasn't there at the defense, but I heard it was very contentious and that he was accused of trying to um, popularize Lacan and to turn Lacan into a like popular thing. Like they really, he did his Great. dissertation. <laughs> yeah. He kind of did. <laughs> he did his dissertation on Hitchcock. And some people really, really, really were upset. <laughs> But like, I had no idea of any of the inner politics. And partially I was blocked from anything because, because my analyst was the director of the department, I couldn't ever talk to him about it. And because my analyst was Miller's brother, that also complicated things. And also Miller, Jacqueline Miller is not a, the easiest person to talk to, but I had to go to him and say, listen, I'm like using a lot of your stuff and this other professor is saying that it's paranoid and psychotic and that he, he will never approve of it. So I don't know what to do. And um, Miller was like, he got really, he just kind of yelled at me and gave me like a copy of like this, like um, a book by Althusser for no reason. I have no idea why, what, what that was about. But um, later he got back, I got, not from him, someone else, See, because I couldn't talk to my, my, the head's apartment because he was my analyst. And Miller didn't want to like directly communicate with me. And because I had uncovered this huge conflict within the department that no one knew about, I had to go to like a third or fourth party to like say, okay, we're going to assign you um, someone to be your dissertation director who I've never met and who doesn't even live in France. But because of the <laughs> because of the laws that France every like three or four years change the laws of what it how you defend a dissertation or what a doctorate is like this is crazy imagine Trump well I could maybe maybe you would do that but like caring much so much that he would change what the criteria for being for getting a dissertation is but in France like every three or four years it would change because the government would change and so they came up with this criteria that to defend your dissertation, you had you have you had to have someone from your department, someone from your country, but outside the department, someone from France, but outside the department, and then someone from outside France, and then like another person, so like four people, something like that. And so um, I was like, how am I gonna do this? I mean, I'm gonna have to like find someone from outside the country, and they're gonna have to be there at the same time as all these other people. And so that I figured out there's good, they were gonna have an international conference, um, Congress in Paris, the Lacan School. And so then I said, well, while that's going on, I'm gonna wait to defend my dissertation. But the result was that um, I wouldn't know anyone basically on my committee and that it was gonna be a public hearing and that like a lot of people might go because it was during the Congress. And no so- No pressure. It, <laughs> It was in this court, it was actually in a courtroom, which is crazy. And um, all I remember is my girlfriend at the time, like crying hysterically through it, because they were like so mean to me. It went on for like five hours. Oh and God. you know, I wrote, I wrote like a 400 page dissertation in French. And, um, and right before I was gonna defend it, my girlfriend who knew French well, she was German, but she knew French well. She read it and she said, your writing style is horrible. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, the, I said, yeah, it probably is because I didn't know, like, you know, it turns out like to write a dissertation in France, you have to use a special tense, the passé simple, the literary tense, which I had never learned. And so I had to rewrite my whole dissertation, like in like two days, so that it would be in this special tense that I had never known existed. And so like the first question that I got was uh, uh, was like basically on page 
227, um, you're using um, the term, you know, that you said some French word, like why? And I was like, ah, like, why didn't you use the passé simple of that? Like that, or really, okay, that's where I so that was. So, but it was interesting. And then the tradition there is after you defend your dissertation, which was brutal. I mean, it was really, really like, they just really, that's kind of the French education thing. They're, they're not like the American education system. They don't like hold anything back. They're very often very aggressive. And so um, afterwards, the tradition is you take them out like to a meal or for drinks. So I had to like, they go pay for them. So after they had all like just attacked me for hours, and um, after that, I got on a plane, like, I think the next day, and I didn't come back to France for, like, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough. Here we say, nuga nug. Enough's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so there was some, like, difficult moments in that, but I think, you know, generally. Um, and then I got back to New York, and, and people were talking about, like, Lacan, and I was just like, I don't recognize any of this. Like, this is like, this is not like the same things that I've been like learning or, or thought or understood. And there's always that kind of idea of like, I think psychoanalysis is very easily misunderstood. I mean, especially with Freud, like some words that are very common words are used in a very different way. And, you know, he has this very counterintuitive understanding of the world. I think that's what makes him very effective and you know interesting but that means it's very open to misinterpretation like so i'll go to these conferences and i'll be just like what are these people talking about this has nothing to do with psychoanalysis i mean are they aware of that you know just like the whole like it, you know face-to-face -face communication or the idea that um the counter transference thing um that like basically when I was working at this clinic in New York, like I would talk to a lot of the therapists and they would tell me like they were constantly talking about themselves. Like they would tell their patients their dreams or they would like make it all about themselves because there was, you know, this idea in, through counter transference or projective identification. That is if you're feeling something, um, then that, that feeling is really a projection of something that the patient doesn't want to deal with and they're projecting onto you. And so you have to then um, articulate that feeling to the person because they've been like repressing that feeling and projecting it. And so then the way you bring it in to the surface is by like talking about yourself, you know? And I remember this one woman, she came to me, she was like very distraught. She said, I have this patient. I don't understand anything he says. He makes me really nervous and anxious. And I said to her, stop trying to understand him just try to remember what words he repeats and once in a while like repeat one of those words and she said like it totally changed the whole thing like took all the pressure away and that like the first time he talked about a dream after that i mean it doesn't always work like that magically but it was like this pressure to understand that's another thing like lacan has this radical perspective that like it's not the job of the analyst to understand and and the whole idea of the transference is moving away from the way that we um, we want the other to provide understanding for us and we want the other to you know resolve all, all of our problems for us and so um, but so many people do not get that they're like they want to like understand and also the role of empathy like Lacan like very rarely talks about empathy there's an interesting passage when he talks about like castration is the lack of empathy of like i have no idea exactly i kind of understand what he means but basically the whole idea of empathy is often that we are um, projecting our own feelings or understandings onto other people and and if you really believe in like a neutrality of the analysts it's empathy is like the opposite like you have to work really hard to kind of frustrate the demand of the patient for, you know, Freud said like the, the child's basically, um, when the child cries, when the baby cries, it's, wants, it's making a demand, not only for like milk, but it's making a demand for love, recognition, and knowledge. And Freud says, 
in the project for scientific psychology, Freud says that's the start of human morality and communication. So in analysis, someone comes to analysis, they have a fundamental demand. And ultimately that fundamental demand, which shapes the transference, is they want the other to um, provide knowledge, love, and recognition. And what the analyst has to do, and even like COVID understood this, is to optimally frustrate that demand. And because ultimately, like when you demand something of the other, what you really want is for the other to sacrifice their own freedom. So when, the, when, when you have a demanding person or a demanding child, what they really want is for like the parent to give in to their demand. So I think that's an interesting way of thinking about the master-slave dialectic. So what's going on in this desire for recognition is ultimately the submission or death of the other. You want the other ones, other person to sacrifice to you. And so psychoanalysis has to break with that. And you can only break with that is if the analyst doesn't play the role of the one who knows or the one who cares or the one who recognizes the patient. And that's like very hard to do or it's not natural. And so many therapists and analysts don't even try to do that. Yeah, I feel like if there's only one thing you do, it's that. <laughs> That's like the most important thing. And I feel like it actually, since learning how to do that as an analyst, it actually has helped me learn how to do that kind of in other situations. And it actually helps other people in general become a little bit less dependent and depending. <laughs> I feel like it's a good life strategy that a lot of people could implement if they understood it better. <laughs> One time I tried to use this kind of, I read this book, it was called Neutral Parenting, and I was trying to use it with my daughter. And, uh, but she's very psychologically smart. Like she, she picks up on everything. And she was like, immediately, you're different. Did you read some book that said that you're not supposed to respond to me like that? And, you know, I don't like it. I liked it better when you're responding to me. And I don't think that's good parenting. And so she could like anticipate what my like, what my parenting like strategy is to like subvert it and, and tell me it's not going to work for her. And uh, that's amazing. Her. Yeah. <laughs> She's a complicated person. She's 15 now. And it's funny cause we're all here together, like kind of in our shelter in place basically situation. And so um, she's a sophomore starting to be a sophomore in high school. So she's been um, at home since March you know, taking her classes online. And so um, it's been an interesting experiment, you know. And I'm teaching um, a film class at my university, writing about film. And I have students from all over the world. I mean, um, many students from China. And it was unclear whether they're going, they were going to be in China or or they were gonna stay here in California, but many went home and didn't come back or they're afraid they couldn't come back or they're afraid, I don't know, but it turns out many are in China, which makes having a class, like the time of the class, almost impossible. But also like the, the number of like complaints and excuses and resistances, you know, related to the technology is just like unbelievable because it is really hard because I'm using all these different technologies. I'm using Zoom. I'm like, um, um, it, to like learn online, I know this is a tangent, but okay. it requires an incredible <laughs> amount of uh, motivation and like self-discipline. You know, you really, and I think that's really hard for a lot of people. And I think there is like this also sense of like alienation that is, you know, generated from the situation and from like trying to learn online like they're they're trying to teach like you know six-year-olds and seven-year-olds through zoom i just yeah i can't, can't even imagine i can't that. i was just gonna say like i think i can't imagine like being in grad school in this situation but really at any level like undergrad too i can't imagine having to all of a sudden learn like this it must be really when we difficult like, to the pleasure principle like i was talking about catharsis and the pleasure principle is, um, you know, the way that the computers, and especially like iPhones, um, they combine together like pleasure devices and work devices. And these things used to be separate, 
separate, right? I mean, it used to be like you had like a phone in one room, a TV in another room, a typewriter in one room, books in another room. And now they're all on the same device. And so it requires a lot of discipline and focus. Like a lot of students now really believe in this myth of multitasking, that they can do multiple things at the same time and they can jump from one thing to the other. And a lot of research says that people, when you multitask, it just takes you longer and you do it, you know. Worse. Poorly. Yeah, and so, <laughs> um, but it's so tempting. Like they, they're sitting there, like I used to like, would walk around different lecture halls at, at my university and see like most of the students were online. And then I did this thing where I used to teach in a computer lab and I we checked the history of how, what students were doing while they were in class. And like they were buying shoes, they were watching videos, even watching pornography in class, you know, which I thought was interesting. And so this kind of like invasion of entertainment into all aspects of our lives and this kind of easy access to pleasure, you just take out your phone, right? I once had a student and I had a policy like no texting in class. Actually, I've moved to like no technology in class, right? So this is really hard for me, this current situation. And I teach mostly seminars. We sit around with actual like paper and books and actually talk about them. And, um, and so uh, the student like would, was constantly on her phone. And so I talked to her after class. I said, you know, it's kind of like disruptive for you to be on your phone. Like, like, why do you constantly turn to your phone? And she goes, well, I only look at my phone when I'm feeling anxious. And I said like, well, what makes you feel anxious when someone says something I, don't, I disagree with? And I thought this was so interesting. Like, so here we get this idea of escaping from tension, escaping from anxiety by turning to the technology. And they gain a sense of control and instant access to pleasure or something that they have you know, control over. And you know, how disruptive this is. And I was I'm writing this book called um, Generation X and the Rise of the Entertainment Subject. And um, and this guy wrote this book called Generation X Goes to College, and he wrote it like 25 years ago. And he describes um, how like all of a sudden students wanted their teachers to be entertaining, how students started evaluating their teachers and evaluating them for their like looks or for their entertainment value. And he describes this one scene, I think it's like 1989, um, where a student brought in a little portable TV and was like looking at it on his desk. And I thought, like, how quaint that is, this, this one student sneaking in a portable TV, when now all the students have their phones and computers and are often during class, you know, receiving media pleasure or, or you know, or entertainment pleasure, and that we have to compete with this um, pleasure principle, you know, that we have to, in all aspects, you know, of life. And you think of something like, like Donald Trump, I think one of the um, one ways to understand like right wing libertarian politics, right, is that like a lot of what Trump is is a reaction, right? He's a reaction to what political correctness, right? The right is often a reaction to having to pay taxes or social welfare programs or immigration. So it's a reactionary discourse. And so it has this kind of cathartic aspect. It's an attempt to escape from the conflict and the shame and the guilt that is caused by like racism or sexism or homophobia or poverty. And so, um, so Trump, you know, as an entertainer, you know, really brings up this, you know, idea that we become like this entertainment society where anything can be turned into entertainment. Politics is entertainment, right? Like you have news and news is a business, but it's also entertainment. So these things that used to be separate, like art and capitalism and democracy are all being combined together and it creates this kind of pleasure principle or catharsis because people are able to escape reality by just instantly accessing entertainment. And um, so, yeah, I think that's like, an important way to think about like the rise of the right as this kind of release of conflicts generated by the left. 
Yeah, and I, I feel like a lot of people even explain it, they like explain it as like this movie they're watching, this movie of life they're watching or this kind of show because it is like, you know, you have a TV villain character <laughs> running running things, you know. Have you watched uh, Handmaid's Tale? Yeah. So I just finished watching that with my daughter. Like we been binge watched three seasons and I think it's like very chilling in a way that it is very close to, it's close but distant. It's like to, and especially like the um, religious conservatism and the kind of um, obsession with um, controlling women. And like that has been like a predominant part of religion, like since the beginning of almost every major religion you can look at as fundamentally about controlling women. And, um, and so like, I think The Handmaid's Tale, like it shows that, you know, you know, behind Trump is like Mike Pence, you know, and like Mike Pence, um, I read like his biography, you know, and, and like, I think he really believes this stuff. Like Trump doesn't believe anything, right? That's a lot what allows him, he's an amoral opportunist. But the question always is, is this coalition between like the right and the conservatives? They're two very different things. They should actually be opposed. Like how can like moral conservative, religious moral conservative, you know, be a supporter of an amoral opportunist, mm -hmm. right? Who really doesn't believe in anything. And part of it is, well, they're both interested in power, right? It's, it's you know, the openly evangel evangelical leaders will say that they support Trump because he's getting their agenda accomplished. He's giving them power, Supreme Court justices, right? Um, and so ultimately that's what they want is power. Um, but you read like Mike Pence, you know, and you start like the things that he says and you really feel like you're reading about like The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> like it's kind of like, he calls his like wife mother, which is just, okay, a little bit question odd, but, um, and I think psychoanalysis is a lot then to try to help us to understand like, what is the psychoanalytic um, understanding of like conservatism, right? And I think like, what I always try to do is think about, well, what does psychoanalysis offer that other discourses can't offer, right? I, you know, like, so what about the psycho psychoanalysis, you know, emphasis on um, unintentionality, like the unconscious, on irrationality? Like, how does that help us to understand, like, conservative rhetoric? And like Lacan talked about, like, the discourse of the master. And the idea that, the paradox is that the discourse of the master, the master actually is conforming to an inherited social hierarchy. And so the master is actually has to submit to a culture that already exists, a, a set of hierarchies of cultural oppositions. And so the master is, a, is in a way um, submitted. And so there is this kind of masochistic kind of foundation to um, religious morality. And that a lot of it is like, you know, I've never been religious, so I have a really hard time like relating to some of this, but this idea like Mike Pence talks about, um, he, you know, he was born again. And, and it started when a friend said to him, Mike, you're just wearing a cross around your neck. You have to wear it in your heart, right? And so like, what does this mean like to wear the cross in your heart? And what does it mean to like be born again and to totally, you know, surrender to Jesus, but then also to make Jesus your friend, you know, and this kind of, um, and Freud said like in Totem and Taboo, like religion um, is about um, making a demand to an imaginary other. It's like the baby who cries for something. Um, he said like, um, we don't give up completely our, the illusion of the omnipotence of our thought, and instead we try to influence this imaginary other. And so like within the discourse of conservative like ideology, 
you have like this idea, this kind of imaginary other, the imaginary father that you um, submit to, but that you also control. And, and so there's this dialectic between like freedom and submission. And this really like, it really reads like eroticized, you know, like submission, like sadomasochism, the way when you hear some of these people describe their their conversion narrative or their, you know, how they submitted to Christ and how that gave them access to like infinite enjoyment and pleasure. I mean, it sounds like Marquis de Sade a little bit, but um, so I think that there's all of these unconscious mechanisms going on in conservative ideology that people don't normally like address or think about. Yeah, yeah. my husband is Swedish and they're not very Christian here. They're pretty secular um, overall. And so when he sees like all the religiosity in America, he just thinks it's so bizarre. And he's the one that kind of pointed out to me how bizarre it was because I just was used to it, you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, and in, in with Christianity in particular, like seeing this like you know, tortured, bloody, naked person, like nailed up in the front of where you pray. And he's just like, he's just like, how could you see this as anything but perverted? Like, like what is this? <laughs> well, imagine, so. imagine if I told you like, okay, you know, our neighbor, Joe, Joe has a son. You know what Joe did? Joe killed his son. He murdered him, <laughs> right. Because those other people across the street, they were doing really bad things. And so he killed his son in order to make those other people like feel better about all the horrible things they did. And like billions of people are gonna like buy that story. It's a really weird story. <laughs> but something like I've, I've talked a lot about, which is slightly controversial is um, like the role of victim fantasies play in, um, in politics and history. And so, um, you know, Freud did this controversial thing was at first he thought all of his female patients were actually sexually assaulted by their fathers. And then he started to think that, well, maybe some of them only imagined that they were assaulted. And so then he came up with this notion of fantasy that people fantasize about um, being assaulted or being beaten um, and so, you know, this is kind of controversial because it makes it seem it kind of like he's not believing the people that have actually been assaulted or violated. Um, but I think it's really important to realize that the victim fantasy structure is like a fundamental structure in the world, especially in politics and history. Like before, like, um, like most religions are based on some narrative of someone being a martyr, someone being victimized. And since the victim is always innocent and you can't criticize the victim, then the vengeance of the victim is always justified. So for instance, after the US was attacked in 9-11, they attacked um, Iraq and then Afghanistan. And the idea was that they um, were victimized. And so therefore their aggression is totally justified and that you can't criticize the victim. And so, and you see that in so many religions or so many wars start when one group says, we're the victim, we're innocent and pure, the other is evil. And, and so therefore all of our vengeance is justified. And what really concerns me a lot is in a lot of contemporary left wing politics, like I used to you know, be very involved in, I, I guess, left wing politics. And, and I really turned on it, like a few things happened. Um, but one is when I realized that um, this kind of like victim narrative um, allowed, like completely dismissed the ability to be self-critical. Um, and also it was often um, justified like incredible like vengeance and aggression towards others. And that, um, and so, I think the victim narrative is a very interesting way to think about like politics, because on one hand you have often the left um, arguing like we have been victimized and, and therefore, you know, um, but we are good and innocent. And so we rally around our victim identity 
Um, and on the other hand, you have the right who's taking that logic and says, we're the real victims. We're victims of taxes, of government regulations, of political correctness. So it's interesting, like Trump, you know, is constantly talking about being victimized. And it used to be like, we thought like the, the right, they're supposed to be these tough guys, you know, it's all about the winners and they hate losers. But it's interesting that they constantly represent themselves as victims. Like I, I live in a place where there's a lot of wealthy people and um, my, my daughter can walk into any room like in school and find like the wealthiest family and then we become friends with them. And so it, what really surprised me about so many wealthy people is they constantly talk about how they've been victimized. And it's interesting, like if I had all this money, if I had five houses and I had unlimited money, I don't know. I don't know if I would spend all my time thinking I was a victim, but it's not just like they, they've adopted this ideology, but they actually, see their life through the narrative frame of being a victim. Like daily experiences are from the perspective of being victimized. And so part of that is like, it allows them to be insensitive, insensitive towards the victimization of others because they're the victims. It also allows them to feel no guilt or shame, right? Because they're the victims. It also allows them to escape any criticism for the way that they act. And, um, and so you have this kind of dialectic between the victimization of the right and the victimization of the left, and they feed each other in this very like self-destructive dance. Um, and both like are constantly, you know, suspending reality testing or critical introspection and are so super invested in their own victim identity that they're unable to, you know, resolve any conflict. I think some of the ideas in your in your book on psychoanalyzing the left and right after Trump. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I talk about that, and um, and also the book Freud for the twenty first century. I, I go over some of that, but um, a lot of people don't like that in the academic world because a it seems like you're blaming the victim, and b um, people hate it when you criticize the left when you're in the academic world. And so, you know, I think, I think, and that's one of the symptoms of the problem, right? So I think these three experiences that really, I think, shifted my perspective that all happened like around the same time period. Um, so one is I, I was the um, faculty union president for the University of California for 13 years. And um, I lost an election and this um, group took over and they were much more like, you could say radical than I was and they, they said like they were going to make the union more democratic, okay. Um, but it, from my perspective, it became like a cult. Like, and 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 so one of the main things we do is negotiate with the university over faculty contracts. And they basically took the position that you know negotiating with the university um, is wrong because the university is by definition evil, and the administration is evil, and so therefore the only thing we can do is strike in order to force the university down to its knees. And so there's this kind of um, like, anti, anti, like antig wait, antagonism, this logic of everything is e either or, you know, it's good us, the evil other. We can't possibly, you know, negotiate with it. So part of the victim identity is the splitting between the good self and the evil other. And then it becomes, difficult to figure out how to negotiate any change or, um, you know, yeah, any social change or any like bargain, like a contract or something, if like we're good and they're evil and our vengeance is always justified. Um, so I had that experience and it's an ongoing experience and they're now they're in COVID and they want to strike but they can't strike and they've, they've been bargaining for two years and they haven't gotten anything and but they have like rallied their troops and so now there's a bunch of people who are really angry and really hate the university but there's like nothing they can do and i think like what happens often on the left i think we need these like progressive social movements to um you know to help people to um especially help you know oppressed groups but they often get fixate, fixated on their own identity and their own victim identity which prevents them from, it's like a passionate attachment. It prevents them from then like um, 
moving towards the goal of like equality or justice or universality. Um, and around the same time, I was working for the Bernie Sanders campaign. I, had, I wrote this book, um, Why Public Higher Education Should Be Free. And um, I guess Sanders read it or someone in the staff read it. And so when he, he, he actually introduced a bill in Congress in the Senate before he ran for president, which is basically, I think based on my book. I mean, it has so much from my book in it, I assume that. Um, and then what happened was um, Pre President Barack Obama, either he read my book or someone else on his staff read it. And so I was invited to go to the White House and I was told at this meeting that my book was the inspiration for the president's free community college plan. So I got like invited to all these meetings at the White House and I met with a lot of congressional leaders and politicians. So I got like very like exposed to um, inside of politics. And it was not a pretty thing, let me tell you. But, um, but what happened with Sanders was like, Sanders would like say the same things over and over again in all his speeches, which I kind of understand. But I said like one point, like I keep on saying like the average donation is $35. Clearly, you said that five months ago, clearly it, the average must have changed in the last, you know, whatever. Like, and then like and his staff said, well, he doesn't like to change. You know, he likes, people like his consistency. But what really freaked me out is going to all these rallies with him was like the fanaticism of the people. And like when I tried to talk to people about like what they actually endorsed, you know, what policies, they had very little to say except maybe like free healthcare or free education, but nothing really about like how these policies could actually come into being or like this idea, yeah, we want a revolution. Well, what kind of revolution? You really want a revolution? You want a revolution with guns in the street? Like what kind of revolution really? Oh, we want socialism. Really? What kind of socialism? Like free healthcare, okay, education, but is that really socialism? Like, do you want to, you know, or, and his whole rhetoric, I thought, was very divisive. You know, like the billionaire class, the 1% versus the 99%. It's just the very, and so I think like the left has been like hindered by this kind of investment in this um, very binary victim identity politics. Um, and then the third thing, and this was interesting, is like I got um, this opportunity to teach at this graduate school in Santa Barbara for psychology, but it's um, the Pacifica Institute. And it's a place where people like doing all different kinds of things, very esoteric things. It was mostly like Jungian, um, but they can get like a PhD in clinical psychology. It's like the only university, I think, that grants PhDs for these alternative forms of therapy. And so um, I was teaching a course on the history of psychology there. And I got like crazy reactions. I've never had this happen before. I had students protest and walk out of class during class. And like, and um, one student wrote a final paper on like basically the, the, the conflict between Freud and um, Jung, but like constantly compared Jung to, I mean, Freud to me, and then wrote a totally like anti-Semitic like paper. <laughs> and it was just like, it was like, um, it was just very hard to like deal with. So I only swept there a short time, but I, I just thought it was an interesting kind of, um, it corresponded a lot with what I was seeing in politics, you know, and like what I was seeing in the union, like these kind of like, I would just say like cults where they are invested in a certain identity that allows them, they bond over their identity. And then it allows them to, you know, just avoid any reality testing, allows them to avoid any critical in introspection, and then rationalize or justifies, you know, violence towards others. And, um, you know, I think that's a very, you know, destructive force within the world. Well, I think like you, like you said, one of the biggest problems is like foreclosing discussion and conversations. Like when one when one point of view doesn't even want to have a conversation with the other point of view because they just believe it's essentially wrong. And then how are we ever going to get anywhere, you know, like that. Right. And I think like, it's, you know, teaching, it's, you know, it's very difficult now because um, like I'm in a teaching centered position. And so I have to care about student evaluations. And so I have to be like hypersensitive about like not offending students, but sometimes offending them is just, you know, talking about issues in the world. Like a lot of people want 
the class to be a purely like safe space, you know, and I think that goes totally against education and also against psychoanalysis. And I think the whole idea of identity politics, you know, psychoanalysis is kind of about like uh, suspending your identity and or challenging your identity or calling to question your passionate attachments. And so I understand like we need like social movements that rally around like a shared trauma or a shared identity. But when those movements get fixated on their own trauma or victim status, then they're unable to, um, you know, advance towards their goal, their ultimate goal of say justice or equality. And I think that's a huge problem, you know, in politics today. I don't know if you've heard Stephen Reisner's podcast, but I think you would like it. Stephen Reisner's been doing a podcast, but it's just him like collecting his thoughts each month and then like having a discussion kind of about current events. And I think it's really great. No, it's interesting. Um, you have to check that out. Um, yeah, I think in your podcast, you've offered like a lot of different perspectives. And I think that um, you generally, you know, let people talk and um, and so it does provide a platform for like kind of a, a diverse range of you know views of trying to use psychoanalysis in, in like very different ways so yeah and yeah. I think a lot of the problem too that you're talking about is that uh, it's not so binary like most issues are like really complex and complicated and have a lot of different nuance and especially depending on all the different situations so it's really frustrating to see like things get ideas get like blanketly applied to like all situations when really like so many situations are so different or nuanced in many different ways that you can't really just say that like this is wrong and this is right you know yeah and that's why i like kind of like the theory of borderline personality disorder um splitting that kernberg you know kind of helped to articulate this idea like what we're seeing in political polarization right is this splitting to avoid um ambiguity complexity um ambivalence and like freud's idea like when he talks about conditions of the love object um, he argues that the splitting occurs between love and desire, that basically the patient wants to, um, doesn't want to be reminded of the mother or doesn't want to feel um, incest, anxiety. I think this is actually the term he uses. And so they have to split the world between like the Madonna and the whore, the ideal. And they can only have sex with the whore and they have to keep the Madonna idealized. And so that splitting we see in politics, you know, the ideal us and the evil other, and that it helps us to over pol political polarization, helps us to overcome any sense of complexity, any sense of ambivalence. And psychoanalysis is all about like complexity and ambivalence and conflict and tension. Um, and so there's this kind of inverted relationship between like this, borderline splitting in politics and psychoanalysis itself. And just one last thing, what's, uh, what's in your book Freud and it's for the 21st century? Um, so I try to present um, like four or five key concepts in Freud and why they can help us to think about and resolve like particular problems going on in the world today. So I already talked about the pleasure principle and catharsis and how like most people don't think about the relationship between pleasure and escape and how that can help us to think about addiction or about like media pleasure or virtual reality, all these ways of instant, instantly gaining access to pleasure, but also you know, ultimately denying reality or escaping from guilt, shame or anxiety. Um, and then I talk about um, just Freud's theory of the unconscious and hysteria and how that can help us to understand things like um, left-wing politics and victim identity and the victim fantasy structure. Um, and I have a chapter on um, Freud's theory of science, which I think is often misunderstood. Like Freud actually, you know, Freud said like science is about accepting the limits of our knowledge and that um, it's the application of the reality principle. 
So I talk about like almost like a self-help. I originally wrote this book as a self-help book, but the publisher hated it, the original publisher. Actually, the original publisher asked me to write it as a self-help book. I wrote it as a self-help book, and then they said they hated it as a self-help book. They thought it was too pandering. But there's this idea like that Freud has of like trying to apply the reality principle to everyday life. And that in some ways, what psychoanalysis is about is radical self-honesty. And you know why it's so hard to be self-honest. And that ties into the idea of repression, a very hard idea for people to actually accept is the idea that we lie to ourselves. Because if we know anything, we know ourselves. So how is it possible that we lie to ourselves? And so I think Freud's theory of repression um, has itself been repressed, like in evolutionary psychology and neuroscience, they have this um, like biological unconscious, but they completely get rid of the idea of repression. So I talk about repression and how that relates to um, narcissism and transference and to um, what I call liberal narcissism. So I try to critique every like political group, which makes me very popular, right? Because uh, I've been told, yeah, like I, I have a critical perspective on every major political ideology. And for some people, they feel like personally offended because like, especially liberals for the idea is people wanna be seen as being good and doing good things and having good intentions. And so, you think about Facebook, what people do is they just post them doing good things or having good moral virtues or you know, being outraged at the right thing. And so, so one idea of, of understanding liberalism is an investment in like the ideal self being recognized by others. And that what, is, what the person is trying to do is trying to escape any you know, feelings of guilt, shame, or criticism by presenting themselves in a certain way so that they get recognition from others and that they maintain the sense of being well-intentioned. And, and, and here we get this idea of virtue signaling. What people don't like about some liberal politicians, they seem to be fake and condescending or they seem, like Hillary Clinton didn't really seem to be invested in the virtues that she was presenting. And that there's this idea as just a way of manipulating other people by getting them to recognize your goodness. And so liberals like to walk around with their organic bags or their hybrid cars and like all that stuff might have a positive effect. But um, I just had a book come out like this week, it's called Zizek and the um, Rhetorical Unconscious. And it's a kind of a critique of Zizek, but it's also trying to look at these four major forms of rhetoric, which are catharsis I talked about but one is pathos, meaning emotional um, persuasion. And there's ethos, which is persuasion based on authority, and logos, um, persuasion based on, um, on reason. But one of the things I try to like, look at in Shizek's work is the way that um, he combines like, serious philosophy with humor and high culture with low culture, and how this is actually reflective of this kind of popular culture um, way of accessing catharsis and enjoyment and this idea that Freud had. So like Freud has these like ideas that are, that what I like about Freud is like he comes out with these insights that like other people really don't seem to have but then they do help to explain so many different things. Um, and one is that like when someone tells a joke what they're doing is basically bribing their audience with pleasure in exchange for the audience not holding them accountable for what they're saying. So it's basically his idea is that I avoid criticism by turning it into a joke. And because it's a joke, you can't hold me responsible for what I've said. And so I think you see that all the time in Zizek, kind of frames his discourse. And this idea of turning like psychoanalysis into like entertainment, the risk of that is that um, it manipulates the audience by making this deal where I give you pleasure in exchange, I escape any criticism. And so he can say sexist or racist or homophobic things, but because he's using it as a joke, he kind of keeps the hate circulated, but under the cover of um, providing entertainment and, and pleasure. Um, so anyway, that was 
that's just to let you know that. <laughs> yeah, but it brings us back to the beginning when you were talking about training and that he was the other person defending. And I was thinking, you know, I actually haven't read much Zizek. I've read the book on violence and I think that's it. Yeah, um, yeah I know. Yeah, I actually haven't, which is interesting. I just kind of huh. like skipped that whole boat or missed it or whatever. But what I will say is that um, a lot of people I talk to, like there's like a whole younger generation of analysts that he got introduced to psychoanalysis from him. So I think that's great, at least. <laughs> One of the reasons my book is that it actually completely, his presentation of psychoanalysis actually represses psychoanalysis. No. Oh. It's not, yeah. it's not uh, real psychoanalysis, but if it gets them reading on their own, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's the positive path. See, <laughs> I adopt that more. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's been great. And I really, you know, enjoyed talking to you and I really enjoy your podcast and we'll continue listening and um, hope to talk to you again, maybe sometime in Sweden. And yeah. Or anytime you have a new book coming out, it seems like you write a lot of them. So anytime you have something new coming out or something you want to talk about, just just email me and you can come back anytime. Okay, thanks a lot, Ness. Yeah. Take care. Bye, Bye. Mom. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Robert Samuels. For more, you can find links to his work in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and poetry from Chapart Books 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T R A P A R T.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, P A T R E O N.com forward slash. V A N E S S A 2 3 C A R L. Your support is greatly appreciated. For more information, you can also visit my website, drvanessasinclair.net, or the podcast main website, renderingunconscious.org. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Gain control of what images she would capture, youth is almost always the emphasis. It is important to her what she wanted to remember in her lifetime, 800 of which remain. So the, and perhaps even history itself, act when it seems as if this is hugely significant for feeling and written, rewritten in a sense. In the, indeed this has been, helplessness and hopelessness that one may feel dominated the rest by sheer force. Works have been found to have microscopic lens. He first began drawing the abstract art, including Soon, he found a way to fashion a microscopic, common, or object while present, but, and his time, which inundated people and experiencing. The shift in the world has been to accepting. Many produce both a familiarity experience, not unlike 
the experience of art as if this history of art of dissonance when confronted similar brand of camera putting the power of Bindi citizen for the first time conclusion of a clear pioneer of getting her due the Swedish artist between life and art Ravini defies herself by not having off Clint was interested in have their art and may art have its disturbing as the first shows of the manifest content of their attack on rigid academic worldview while the latter particles plants and such qualities and abilities that such skills in work with the boundaries she left upon her death. Training over a person's lifetime. While this art market, another frequent, the radical possibilities of attended exhibition in art critics, dealers, and parties if not actively persecuting their own groups and shows, ignored or unappreciated, Viennese secessionist group, retrospective entitled during their lifetimes, in the ethically resigned from the association, reportedly aware of, off, exiled, but of course, over time, main concern was with freeing, freeing for the guardian, become the new norm, and masterpiece of design, and no one design continues. Snowflake melted, that design was forever, capturing images of accidents, crime scenes, recall, reproduce and recreate this might seem was the time of prohibition gang violence and shift life and narrative in a new way in a way more in rather than what they'd been born into based on 